7 o'clock. Hi, everyone. This is Doc T, Jeff Tucker, broadcasting you live from Jensen Beach, Florida, where we do not have any snow today. And I guess spring has sprung in di different areas, different ways, but snow is good. Uh, my father-in-law is here, and he calls it um, the farmer's fertilizer in the spring. And my wife is here, Kathy, and my son, Matt. We're all sitting here going to try and teach you something about caudal heel pain or navicular disease or navicular syndrome or something that you may not have heard of in the past. Okay, so I'd like to welcome you. Um, this is a presentation of my horse talk series at the Horses Advocate, and I'm going to give a plug shamelessly for the Horses Advocate and the equine practice in just a moment. And the moment is here. So the equine practice, I love you all to write down simply the equinepractice.com. Maybe, Matt, you can put it in the chat session. Um, put down the website, the equinepractice.com. It is the uh, main page where you go and become an advocate by just clicking the advocate menu at the top of the page. Or you can find out about our dentistry because that's all we do is dentistry. But I love teaching. That seems to be the thing that uh, drives me, juices me, keeps me going. Every time I go to a barn, float horses' teeth, I'll talk about anything, and about horses anyway. And uh, well, there's a lot to talk about other things. Uh, but knowledge is power, and I think is the more information we have on things, the better off we are. And I love to tell people that when they're um, building the box in which everyone says I should be thinking outside of, I was already outside playing in the dirt and watched the box go up and everybody encased in it. I felt like I was left out for a while. Now everybody's trying to get out of the box and think of things in different ways because it's just been complexicated, which is a new word I developed, which means things are a little bit more complicated than they need to be. <clears throat> and so tonight I'm going to talk about navicular in a simple way. Uh, and recording this webinar is going to be uh, done. It's automatically put on YouTube, but we're going to um, chop off the entrance and some other things, and um, make sure that it looks pretty good for you. And it's also going to be posted on my website. So while you're sitting here listening to me, I hope you don't go away. Um, I hope you stick around because uh, this is just fascinating stuff. Uh, and I want to talk about it because understanding the basic laws of physics will help you understand the cause, the treatment, hopefully the prevention. And prevention is key because I believe most caudal heel pain is man-made. And if you can prevent that from happening, you can prevent a lot of angst and pain in your horse. And somebody's asking to take a Oh. Make the display bigger. Oh, yeah, I guess I could. If you guys could um, bear with me, I'm going to try something. Let's see. Does that work? It's better. That's bigger now. All right. Well, I'm trying to split screens and have things on both pages, and um, I don't think that's working. It's not good. Do what you usually do. All right, everybody, hang tight. I'm going to do a little technical thing here, um, and let's see. I have no idea. What are you guys seeing right now? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, does that look better, everybody? Okay, great. Uh, if you've got any more complaints, just be sure to let me know. Um, I try to do something technical. Yeah, I'm going to keep the, the uh, thumbnails on the side because that way I can see what's coming up, if you guys don't mind. Um, and it's just a way of presenting that some people like and some people don't like, but that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, um, the one thing I, I want to teach you about is tr is physics, and I know a lot of you are just going to tune out and say, oh my gosh, don't talk to me about physics because physics just doesn't make sense to me, and um, that's okay. Um, why did this, oh, I see. Um, here we go. Um, Physics is very important, but I need to just remind you that I'm not your veterinarian. I don't have an um, intimate uh, relationship with your horse. I haven't seen it. I can't be your uh, veterinarian. I don't want to get your horse or, or your veterinarian upset or your fear upset with me by just stepping in there and giving advice directly. 
but I do want to make sure that you understand some of the principles so you'll be able to help them uh, and communicate with them a little bit better. A little bit about me, for some of you who have not uh, listened to my webinars before, I've been with horses since 1973. I've been a veterinarian since 1984. That's me with a retired Olympic um, dressage horse that um, he and I just had a really strong relationship with. Uh, I miss him terribly, but um, he's just uh, out to pasture someplace. Anyway, I've seen a ton of uh, horses. I love to take photographs. I'm a photographer. Most of my stories are through photographs. And when you go to the Horses Advocate, which is um, my site of teaching, my, the learning center, I call it, it's loaded with about 6,000 photographs of just about every subject you can possibly imagine. Uh, and it's growing every day. So uh, just sign in for it. It's free. You should check it out. All right. I'm going to go over caudal heel pain, which uh, used to be called navicular. She used to be called navicular syndrome. And when I went to vet school in the 1980s, early 1980s, it was called navicular disease. Um, it's, uh, and I'm going to go over the anatomy in just a second to describe it. But a lot has changed recently with the diagnostics that we have, with uh, the digital x-rays, the CAT scans, the MRIs, etc. They have really complicated things. They spend ad nauseum hours discussing what nerve blocks work, what don't work. Uh, if you can inject the coffin joint, does that... Uh, go into the navicular bursa, does that help diagnose some of these uh, caudal heel pain things, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think we as horsemen are left out in the cold not knowing what to do. And, and that's why I want to go over this. I want to take this horse's foot that's sitting here in front of you, and I want to um, show you the anatomy, and then I want to show you what's wrong with this foot, and I want to teach you how you can look at your own horse's feet to see if what's going on. Now, I want to warn everybody that this is not a complete uh, discussion on navicular. It just can't be, not in the time frame that we have. But it's going to be the what I call the lateral view. And you have to think of the hoof in three dimensions. It's not just a lateral. It just means you're looking at the foot from the side. You have to look at it from the front, from the back, from underneath, and look at it as a three-dimensional entity. But three-dimensional looking at this, especially as we discuss vector analysis, which is a form of physics and mathematics combined, um, it will completely blow your mind to the point where you'll say, ah, I don't get it. So I just want to stick in two dimensions. And I think if you start to understand just this two-dimensional thing, you're going to get a huge handle on what's going on. So let's uh, immediately go right to it. This overlay shows a, a schematic of the uh, different bones. You have down in the hoof the coffin bone, the triangular shaped bone. Behind it the big blue dot is the navicular bone. Above it is the short pasture bone and above that is the long pasture bone. That, that makes up the uh, pasture <clears throat> with a fetlock uh, at the top of the picture. And the red thin line behind there represents the deep digital flexor tendon which comes down the back of the leg, goes around the fetlock and comes down the back of the pasture, wraps around the navicular bone and attaches to the coffin bone. It's the navicular area that everyone is focusing on, and it's this juxtaposition of these three things, uh, the navicular bone with the bones and the tendon. Now, if you think of tendons like a pulley, uh, like a string that connects the hands of a puppeteer to the puppet itself, the hands represent the muscles, the strings are the tendons, and the bones are the uh, puppet itself. Every time the muscle contracts, just like the fingers, it moves the puppet, it also moves the foot. But it has to get around certain areas that are in tight spaces and have angles. And so nature's con uh, conveniently made these sesamoid bones. Um, the proximal sesamoid bones are up in the fetlock, <clears throat> but the distal sesamoid bone is also called the navicular bone and allows this uh, tendon to, to easily uh, go around here with lubrication and a mechanical advantage. And that's what it's there for. And every time the horse steps on the ground and then pulls his body over the top of that foot in what we all call a step forward, he actually pulls the tendon and pulls against the foot. And because there's friction of the foot hitting the ground, the foot can't slide. If he were on ice, he'd just be able to slide it backwards and he wouldn't go anywhere. But because he has traction and he pulls, instead of pulling the foot backwards, he ends up pulling his whole body forwards. That's a really cool concept because most people don't think of it that way. But he plants the foot, pulls the tendon, pulls the body forward until the foot is now 
pulled off the ground behind him, and then he swings it forward, plants it again, and does enough, another movement. <clears throat> and there's a lot of pressure that occurs where the deep digital flexor goes around the tendon, uh, pardon me, around the navicular bone. And that's the navicular area we want to talk about. So these big thick blue lines represent the pulling of the tendon up against that uh, navicular bone. All right, so keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to this. I also want to show you something else here. It's called a broken pasture and hoof axis. You can see the words off to the right, and you see a couple of thin white lines. The first lower one is parallel to the hoof, and then as it comes up to the coronary band, it breaks and goes up along the axis of the pasture. This should be a straight line. When it's not a straight line and it's a uh, acute angle like this, I call it a broken hoof pattern axis. And this is because this horse has been suffering from caudal heel pain or pain in the navicular area for a long time. And he's now got this confirmation. I may not be actually telling you the truth there. He may have gotten this confirmation because he was trimmed this way year after year and now he has caudal heel pain because of it. And that's the dilemma. What came first? And that's what we want to talk about today. In this next picture is another horse. I'm sorry it's a little out of focus, but this is another horse that also has navicular disease. But you can see from the two red lines that it's more straight. The pasture angle and the hoof angle <clears throat> is very straight, which is really good. And that's what I think the farrier is trying to do here. He's also done some other things to this foot, which we'll go over later, such as the uh, rolled toe. And you see how the toe is sitting way far back underneath the hoof foot. But there's something that's even that's very sinister here on this. And I want to show you with this next overlay. Look at the coronary band. <clears throat> that's represented by the curved horizontal line. And if you go from left to right, you can see that it dips down. And that shouldn't be like that. It should be more straight. And there's a reason for that. And in addition, you'll see another uh, long red line down by the heel. If you look at that angle, and you look at the angle of the red line in the front of the hoof, you'll see that those two lines are not parallel, and they should be parallel. Parallel lines are great, but when they're not parallel and they're at this angle, it's what we call uh, underslung heels. And notice the two vertical white lines. The distance uh, between those two lines should be about half an inch. Now, the white line on the left is where the heel touches the ground, and the white line on the right is dropped perpendicular to the bulb of the heel. And again, that distance should be about a half an inch. And when it's a, greater than that, and certainly here it's over an inch, uh, that's, that's very bad. And so this is a very sinister picture of someone who's trying to really work on this horse and correct things with uh, shoeing and with proper placement, but they're very, very far away. And again, I've got so much more to tell you on this. Uh, I just don't... Uh, I just want to go back to the beginning. So <clears throat> let's put our uh, take our cowboy hats off and put on our, our mathematician's hat, if you, if you will. And we're going to talk about vectors. And I'm going to explain this by me throwing a ball. And I'm sure everybody here has thrown a ball or thrown something. And it, even if you want to right now, you can pick up something, a pen, um, or something that, that's not going to hurt anybody. And you may want to do this, this little experiment. But if I throw a ball in outer space where there's no friction or wind or gravity, it will continue to travel in a straight line. Wow, I think I've got a duplicate here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I see. Okay, but when thrown on Earth, the gravity will take the ball straight to the ground. In other words, if I just let go of it, gravity is going to take it straight to the ground. But if I throw it and add gravity, that ball is going to land someplace out in front of you. Let me graphically show you. This golden dot on the left-hand side is the ball, and I'm going to throw it directly to the right. <clears throat> if there's no gravity, that ball will continue on forever. But the blue vertical line facing down represents gravity, and gravity is going to take that ball down. Now, in this next shot, the red line shows <clears throat> where the ball ends up, and it's all dependent on how fast I want to throw it. And if I wanted to, I could actually arch it up in the air and make it go further. Um, but whatever it is, this is called a vector. It's the addition of these two um, uh, big arrows. And I'm going to explain that to you in just a second. 
It's a sum of the forces and their directions applied to an object to mathematically yield a resultant movement. Now these are my words. I didn't copy it from anywhere. That's just the way I speak sometimes. But it's used in every sport from billiards to baseball. When a baseball is thrown, they throw it with such a velocity that it goes virtually straight. A bullet out of a gun goes very fast and continues on until gravity finally pulls it to the ground. And it, it could still have a lot of potential in it, a lot of velocity, a lot of force. But gravity is going to take it to the ground and it's going to skip on the ground after a while. The important thing for all of us horse people to know is vector analysis will explain the shape of the hoof and the cause or the result of most lamenesses. Usually the horse either has bad conformation or the routine hoof care has developed an adverse condition within the hoof that will create caudal heel pain. The result of the pain causes the horse to alter his gait and land on his toe first with a heel landing last. So <clears throat> let me just regroup for a second because I may be going a little bit too fast. I'm going to back up for a second. The golden arrow going to the right is the force or the velocity of the ball. And the blue vertical is gravity taking it down. That's why when you gently toss something across the room, it's not going to make it to the other side. It's going to land on the floor someplace. If you throw it fast enough, it's going to hit the wall. If you don't throw it at all, it's just going to drop at your feet. Keep that in mind as I look here. This is the schematic of a hoof with its toe just touching the green line, which is ground. Now, when there's pain in the heel, the horse doesn't want to walk on it. He wants to land on his toe. And we're going to go with the premise that this kind of uh, way of going is caused from pain. But I could eliminate the word pain and say that your farrier is trimming your foot so it has a long toe and he's taken off the heel. The same thing will occur. So it doesn't really matter how you get to this point. It's more important that you understand what happens at this point. Because once you understand this, then you can actively start to prevent it or take care of it if your horse has it. This blue vertical line that's coming down <clears throat> is, is the gravity line. And I made it this length to arbitrarily say that's how much force gravity is putting in there. On the moon, it would be much shorter because you'd be bouncing around because there's not as much gravity there. <clears throat> and if you're on a planet closer to the sun, gravity would be greater. That's just the way physics is put together. But one thing about Earth, it doesn't matter whether you're here or in Africa or any other part of the country or the world, gravity is always the same um, force going down. <clears throat> now, I want you to look at this red line that starts at the toe of the hoof and comes all the way across the bottom of the foot with the arrow facing to the right. This is the radius of a curve. Now, as the toe hits the ground, this heel is going to be brought down because of gravity. I think we all can agree with that. The weight of the horse is going to bring that heel down. And this arched red line represents the curve that it's coming down with. It's supposed to be a perfect curve, but I didn't make it perfect, but you get the point. In other words, this is a radius, and the foot is going to stop on its toe and then rotate down. And it seems like a very simple thing. But this is really cool when you look at it for the vector analysis. I want to look at what's inside that circle where the, the gravity is coming down. And I've kind of expanded it to the right. So you see gravity is coming down with this blue line. And the arrow has a force going to the right, represented by the small arrow going to the right. The reason it has it is, is because the foot is rotating down and the point of the heel is going to move backwards just a smidgen. And that's a force. That force is provided by the circle. Now what's really cool is on Earth, we always equal and oppose every force applied to it. This is why when we're standing on the ground, we don't fall through the Earth. The Earth pushes back with an equal weight. And every time we stand on the scale, we're actually measuring the force that the earth is pushing us back onto, our, onto the bottoms of our feet, and it's measured as a weight. And that's what the vertical blue line is going up straight to the green line. But what is interesting is there's some sort of law that says for every uh, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I have to make a red line 
going to the left that's equal in size and opposite in direction. And when I draw a line between the tip of the red <clears throat> arrow and the tip of the blue arrow, that's called a vector. That is the sum of the force or the velocity or the potential of that uh, force and the direction. Now here's the catch. If the toe was allowed to slide forward, the horizontal forces would have a zero effect on the rotation of the hoof. In other words, the horse would land toe first and the toe would continue to slide forward as the heel came down. Imagine the horse's toe lands on ice and instead of it catching and the heel rotating down, it instead slides forward and the heel goes straight down. There's no lateral movement. However, because the toe is stuck, the hoof isn't and the hoof isn't elastic, then the rotational force is going to crush the heel and cause underrun um, underrun heels. So this big thick blue line is showing you the force that I'm talking about. Again, because the toe of the foot is stuck and can't rotate, and that gravity is going to take the heel down, the forward force the one heading toward the toe is going to push the heel in and cause the underrun um, toe, uh, underrun heel, and the crushing of the tubules. Let me see if I can go back and show you this. <clears throat> this is an underrun heel, and where the heel is touching the ground, that should be back more toward the uh, the vertical line dropped from the bulb of the heel. But it's not because the horse has leaned in on its toe so often and the two wheels have been crushed. And if you look at this picture here, you can actually see the two wheels. I actually have a better picture of it down here. Oh gosh, I had a picture of it. Where did it go? This is so frustrating. You can see you can see the lines here. Um, on the the line should go straight from the corner band down to the down to the ground, and it's not doing it here. And this just really it's crazy. I guess you can't see it there. I apologize, folks. That was there this afternoon. It seems like it disappeared. But anyway, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to go over this one more time. It's this bottom force that's moving forward that's jamming up against this foot on the toe. And the toe will kick out some dirt. These navicular horses, or called heel pain horses, will land on the toe. They'll throw dirt up in the air. And it jabs, and this bottom uh, red force is going to force the heel in, and that's what crushes the tubules. The tubules that come along the side of the foot should look parallel. You can see them with your eye. They should look the same at the toe as they do at the heel. And these horses with the navicular, they follow that unparalleled line of underrun heels, and everything gets crushed there. All right, let me move on. This is the thing. Bottom line, long toe, low heel equals caudal heel pain. That's the critical part. It's irrelevant what came first, whether it had a long toe, low heel due to improper trimming or it got caudal heel pain and developed long toe and low heel. You have to get in there, recognize when your horse's toe is long, heel is low, and correct that. Because if you can prevent it, you can. there's a good chance you can, you can correct what's uh, causing suffering in your horse. And some of these horses are so uh, subtle at the beginning that you don't notice it until a lot of damage is done. So the sooner you get to it, the better. <clears throat> Do you remember the deep digital flexure and its relationship to the navicular bone? I showed it to you in this picture <clears throat> with the um, blue lines going up, pulling on the red line tendon against the navicular. But what's interesting is pressure is applied to that navicular bone as it's pulled up. Just imagine you've got a pulley that you've attached to the uh, rafter in your barn or maybe to a tree and you've dropped a rope through it. You've got some weight on one side and you've got yourself on the other. And <clears throat> you're standing right next to the weight so the rope goes straight up to the rafters around the pulley and straight down and you pull on that rope. You know how hard it is to pull that up? I mean it's, it's not as hard as maybe it could be without a pulley but it, it, there's some effort applied. Now if you walk to the other side of the barn and, and halfway up to the, to the loft, so now the rope instead of going straight up and then straight down goes straight up and then kind of an angle, a 45 degree angle and you pull it, 
it's easier to pull up. There's, there's not as much effort to get it started. There's less pressure put on the pulley. And I'm going to explain why. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> the left-hand side is what I call a normal hoof because the hoof wall and the passion wall are in alignment. It's got a nice short toe. It doesn't have underrun heels. Um, and the red line represents the tendon coming around the navicular bone from the bottom of the coffin bone on up the back of the pastern. And I have a small curved yellow line to indicate that this is the angle that we're looking at. And on the right hand side, I have another picture of a long toe, low heel conformation with a broken hoof pastern axis. This is typical of uh, caudal heel pain horses. And if you notice, the red line has more of an acute angle. And what I did was I copied the yellow line in the left diagram and pasted it on the right so they're identical. And you can see that there's a different change in angle. And that big yellow arrow is pointing to that so you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's because there's a steeper angle there that we're starting to have some pressure put on. Now I know you guys are pretty clear about the pulley in your barn and lifting a bale of hay with it and that it's a little bit easier if you go out a little bit rather than stand right underneath it. Here's the vector analysis of that. If you look at the horizontal white line and then the red ball, that's the navicular bone, and then the, the, line, the white line goes up toward the blue arrow, that represents the tendon being pulled up the pastern around the navicular bone. And if we draw a line between the point of the um, uh, one end of the tendon all the way up to the point of where the blue um, arrow is, that's going to be the vector. And you can see from the yellow uh, arrow on the left-hand side that if you transpose that over to the right-hand side and there's more of an angle on that tendon and you can see how the vector is now pointing up further because it's changed direction, you can see that to make this, this work, I would have to make a bigger yellow arrow. And that bigger yellow arrow, maybe... Maybe I can do it here. Tell me if you guys can see this. I would have to increase the force. See what happened? Do you guys all see that? Okay. What that means is this force is now larger. It's got a greater magnitude, yet it's still pointing right down at this, at this navicular area. And that extra pressure is causing more pain. So if you have a broken passenger hoof axis, this is why a lot of pressure is applied onto the navicular bone. So now we've got a couple of things that are going on. We've got the toe first that's causing the crushing of the heel. That leads to underrun heels. It also leads to contracted tendons, pardon me, contracted heels. It also can lead to sheared heels if the horse decides to land on one side more than the other. So the bulbs of the heel aren't even across. One is higher than the other. And that's um, that's some of the sequelae that can occur from these horses that are landing on the toe because they're so painful in the heel. And here's the other thing. If you have a broken passenger hoof axis, you're going to be applying more pressure <clears throat> to the navicular bone. Okay, we're about halfway through. It's uh, coming up on 7.30. And I just want to take a little bit of a break and see if there's anybody who has any questions on vector analysis. Because even though a lot of you guys want to know about navicular, um, Nobody, I think, ever teaches it in terms of math and physics. And I know this might be a little bit different for you, and it might be hard for you, some of you to understand, but it is fresh thinking, I hope. And I think with these kind of thoughts in your brain, you can go back and look at your horse and see if he's jogging on a flat level surface. You can see if he's landing toe first. Because if he's landing toe first, he's trying to avoid pain in his heel, or he's been trimmed to the very long toe and a low heel, and he's jabbing it, and it's going to create these changes in the hoof because the hoof will change according to the forces applied to it. And that's what we have to watch out for. So I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to sip some coffee, see if anybody has any questions on this. When you all sign up for the Horses Advocate by going to... You got one? Okay. By going to... Um, um, the equinepractice.com, and then you click on the advocate page and, and you sign up to become an advocate. Uh, you can go to the lameness page, and I have a whole uh, three videos on navicular uh, disease, I called it when I made them, or caudal heel pain. And 
I go into this a little bit deeper and you might want to take some time and go over there. It'll take about 17, 18 minutes of video time in, in like five minutes, five minutes and seven minutes I think. And, and it goes into this in a little bit more depth in a whiteboard presentation that I made that um, might help you with this understanding. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Amy says most of navicular is caused by poor wrong foot trimming question mark um, <clears throat> it's it's the chicken or the egg I think that there are some horses that are predisposed to caudal heel pain because they have poor conformation uh, but I think on the other hand it's developmental and I see a lot of people or I've seen a lot of horses and I've never seen navicular disease in young horses it's always uh, in mature horses and when I see it, I usually see these changes in the hoof. So the question is, were, did those changes come from improper trimming of the horse's foot? I don't know. I think there's a lot of good farriers out there who can really see this stuff and prevent it. But I think that there's a lot of farriers out there who um, will focus on just the toe and not the heel. And you can get a lot of um, uh, uh, things occurring there. Uh, I have a chicken egg question. Is the broken heel passion accident result of lazy trimming or is it a wear pattern indicating possible neuromuscular dysfunction of the forelimb movement? Um, when you have neuromuscular um, dysfunction, which just means there's some other cause up the leg that's causing foot to land wrong, that's completely different. Usually that occurs in one foot and the vicular syndrome or caudal heel pain is usually bilateral. Although it can be much worse in one foot than the other, that's just because the horse favors one, just like you and I are mostly right-handed. And there's uh, others that are out there that are left-handed, but it's just not as many. So I think horses favor one side. Um, and, and if you have a neuromuscular problem in the upper leg, like um, anything from the shoulder or, or um, uh, some other pain in the knee of a retired racehorse, you can get some changes in the hoof. And that actually is an important point because the hoof is so changeable it changes right in front of your very eyes because of different uh, forces that are applied to it. And that's the, good, that's the point. I'm trying to let you know that the forces are all pure physics and, and you need to be aware of it, look for it, and then adjust as you go and try and get them away from here. Uh, one of the questions is, um, uh, how can I change underrun heels and angles? Um, that I'm going to address toward the end because there's no recipe. There's no recipe because everyone is different. There's an infinite amount of variabilities here, especially if we start looking at this in three dimensions because you can have a horse landing toe first but then landing on his medial heel and then his lateral heel and that can apply all sorts of different forces. And then what happens is uh, some farriers will come in there and try to adjust for this and they adjust wrong so it actually accentuates what's going on. So uh, there are some secrets and some um, uh, tricks that I'm going to go over in a second. But let me move on and see if I can get some, through some of this thing. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we looked at this picture. It says, note here that the passenger and hoof axis is more in alignment, and so the force being applied to the navicular area will be less cause um, uh, stress on the deep digital flexor. Also note that the toe has been shortened and the shoe set back away from the toe to shorten the length decreasing the effort needed to get the hoof out of the way. And I'm going to explain that in a second. And remember, the longer the toe, the more effort is required to lift the foot and get it out of the way. That lifting applies more force to the inflamed area. So the longer the toe, the harder it is to get the foot up and out of the way. And what I'm going to try and do now is, there's a video. If I start to play it here, maybe you guys can tell me if you can see it. This is my representation of the long toe. Oh, good. Horse. Can you hear it? I call it the clown shoes. There's a lot of vertical movement. You see how the knee goes up? Okay, I'm going to stop it for just a second. I'm glad that you can see this. Um, this is um, Melissa in clown shoes. And the clown shoes represent a long toe, low heel. But I have to really stress, our heel is equivalent to the horse's hock. So in no way, shape, or form is this like navicular or caudal heel pain. But what I'm trying to show to you in this video is the physics and the dynamics of what a long toe low heel can do. 
and we're going to watch it. And sometimes this might be a little long, but I really want to get my point across. And I put it in slow motion so you can really see it. And as long as you can hear the narration, I'm just going to mute my mic or just be quiet. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, the same person. In <laughs> it's Melissa. She she floats teeth with me. Hi, Melissa, if you're listening. Um, in high heels, which is the epitome of a short toe high heel, and you're going to see the change um, in the movement. So listen to what I got to say and watch what's going on, and we'll go from there. The, the feet are being stride. There's not not a long stride. Here. So watch this in slow motion. See how vertical that is. You have to get vertical just to get started to get the front foot in front of you, and then the next foot can stride out a little bit more. And as this whole walk continues in slow motion, you're going to see that the stride does go out further, but with each landing, it's on the heel. Now, I know this isn't equivalent to the horse's foot, but the idea is very similar. When the horse with a long toe, low heel is asked to uh, work and there's no pain in the foot, the horse will try to get the foot out there, but there's more vertical downward force landing on the foot, which causes more concussion on the sensitive structures of the hoof, including the navicular bone, navicular bursa, and all the other tendons and ligaments in the caudal heel of the horse. This is why long toe, low heel is so detrimental and causes more lameness in horses than anything that you'll ever see. A few more steps here and we'll go into the other direction. Okay, here we are jogging. You see how the vertical movement occurred? It's more vertical and it's slam, slam, slam. It's straight up and it's almost a hop. You almost have to hop to get the toe out of the way. You notice as the toe kicks out behind, it actually slips forward because there's so much fulcrum or so much um, rotational torsion on the toe that the tendons are pulling the coffin bone away from the hoof wall. That's another reason why we don't like low heel and long toe. So here's a high heel model of high heel short toe. And this is her walking, and the walk is much different than the jog, and we'll see that as we progress here. But here, everything seems to swing forward, so the swing phase of the gait is longer, and that's always important because there's less time on the concussive forces of the support phase. In addition, the support is more evenly distributed between the toe and the heel, and you can see how her leg just lifts up and is and it's a lazy movement forward. Now here we are going to the other side at the walk, and we'll do this in slow motion as well. See how much easier it is for her to just move that foot forward. And again, a uh, high heel, short toe is the same uh, type of physics evolved, involved in the horse's hoof. The horse can move the leg forward easier. There's not as much pull on the deep digital flexion flexor tendon, so it's not pulling the coffin bone away from the hoof, and you aren't getting the concussive forces on the uh, heel itself. Now here she is running, and you can see how freely that swing is. Here it is in slow motion, and it's just the first step out is long, and she just keeps moving that foot out. This is that extended um, trot that you like to see, where the toe is landing way out there, and you can see the foot floats by. See it float right there? It just floats, just like that. Now we're going to do real time to the right here, and she's doing what I call daisy cutting. The toes aren't getting much more than an inch or so off the ground. Look at that. It goes straight out. There's no vertical movement. Just it comes right out because she doesn't have to worry about lifting the foot up and getting the toe out of the way. Look how low the toe is to the ground as she moves forward. As it's landing on the toe, she's able to move her body forward over it. And as she gets toward the end here, she's really striding out. See that floating in the feet? All right, I'm back. Uh, sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, we might want to get scientific and, and study the analytics, the vector analysis, to, to realize that the forces are being applied. But I think everybody has pretty clear in their mind uh, what it's like to try and walk or move around the house with clown shoes on versus some high heels, uh, although I'm sure some of you cowboys out there uh, aren't going to put on a set of high heels. You do know that the, the physics is the same, and, the, and we see this the same in, in horses uh, that are trimmed differently. If you can get that heel back 
and start to raise it up so it doesn't have that crushing anymore um, and get that short fulcrum by shortening the toe, rounding the toe so it can move forward, um, you're going to see your horse improve dramatically. All right, prevention. This has only been the side view. I said that right in the beginning. We're not looking at the medial to lateral or the straight on view or from the bottom, although that's really important to look at as well. Uh, but other effects can occur. Uh, some of the things are contracted heels, sheared heels. Sheared heels is when you look at the bulbs of the hoof from behind and one is higher than the other. They should be equal in height. You can have disruptions in many soft tissue parts within the heel of the hoof. That's why we call it caudal heel pain. In fact, back in the 80s, it was just called navicular disease, but as we got more and more diagnostic things, they've come up with at least 13 different causes of pain in the caudal heel, uh, including a uh, lysis of the bone, uh, spurs, ligament strains, bursitis, um, altered blood flow, and even fractures of the coffin bone, uh, pardon me, of the navicular bone. So there's all different things that go on there. And, you know, I really like the idea that we have all these diagnostics, and it's really good. But the problem with the diagnostics is the problem is still long ho toe, low heel, and the fist is being applied to the foot. And if we can just understand that one thing and start with our young horses and prevent this from happening, I think we'll pretty much not get rid of um, navicular disease, but we sure can diminish it or at least have it uh, come on in a much later point in their life when they're being just turned out to pasture just wandering around. All right, so I just want to explain that it's too lengthy a discussion to get into it at this uh, stage. We're at about 40 minutes or so, and I want to leave plenty of time for people to ask questions. But step one in prevention is to prevent it from occurring in the first place. If you have young horses that are two, you know, yearlings, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, just stay on top of it. The racehorses as a, as a group tend to have long toe, low heel. Uh, it seems that that's something that they like out there. Maybe it gives them more power, but there's uh, some other added benefits of long toe, low heel that I'm not discussing here. One of them is if your horse has any uh, laminitis, it can decrease the pulling of the coffin bone away from the inflamed tissue of the lamina. So that's very important. If you have a horse with bowed tendons or tendon problems, uh, it could be caused by long toe, low heel because the horse has to pull so much harder on that tendon to make the horse go forward. And over time, you can build up a lot of heat and cause that tendon to literally rupture. And overnight in front of your eyes, you'll see a horse with a tendon that's twice its size. And usually when you look down, you'll see long toe, low heel. So it is multifaceted, but I want to get that point across the navicular uh, as far as doing it. Uh, and that's all I have to offer for prevention. Just keep the tone heel normal for your horse. And when I say normal in quotes, every horse is different. Every horse has a different foot. And it's up to you to really look at it and feel it. Um, watch the tubules. And I apologize again for not having the picture. I, I've got it on the website. When you sign up to become a horse's advocate, go in there and look at all my hoof pictures. And you'll see the tubules. You'll see them on your own horse. They run uh, from the coronary band perpendicular uh, from the corner band, it angled with the hoof wall straight to the ground. And they should be the same from the, um, the toe region through the quarters down to the heels. They should be parallel. But you'll find in these guys that they're not. They're not at the same um, angle. They've, they've gotten more parallel to the ground, so they're, they're being crushed, and the heels are sticking way out behind. And as somebody uh, in, the, in the chat asked, how do you prevent that, or how do you move it backwards? That is something that is uh, between you and your farrier. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you need to know the lateral angles as well as the front to back angles. And you have to find out exactly what has to be done. What? Oh, sorry. I just put my hands over my face and everyone's jumping on me because, sorry. <clears throat> I get in a zone sometimes and I start thinking about stuff and, and, um, and I was massaging my brain. Anyway, I want to go into prevention. Let me have a sip for just a second. This is something else that nobody's going to talk about when it comes to lameness. And it bothers the heck out of me. And I hope you don't mind if I just take a little divergence out here and talk about protein. Uh, protein is uh, something that cannot be absorbed uh, by anybody's body, not yours, not your horse. Uh, it has to be broken down into smaller particles. No protein can be absorbed through the gut wall. The gut wall is a solid tube that runs from your mouth to your anus 
and whenever you eat and swallow you're just placing food in that tube that food is not inside of you yet so any protein that you put in there whether it's chicken or vegetable you know meat or vegetable it doesn't matter fish it all has to be broken down into the amino acids and they have to be absorbed through there now the amino acids come in two varieties essential and non-essential the non-essential amino acids can be taken in as any kind of molecule and assembled into amino acids which can then be assembled into proteins uh, carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen sulfur they can all come together and create these non-essential amino acids now what's one thing what's interesting to know about ruminants such as the cow the goat the sheep and deer um, and antelope and all the other ruminants um, they don't need to eat a lot of the essential amino acids that's the other group the essential amino acids you must consume whole they have to be eaten as amino acids you cannot make them the ruminants don't have that many and that's why you see the fat goat on top of the garbage pile eating from a tin cup uh, because he doesn't need to get really good quality protein he can assemble it and make it but horses and humans are very similar they need to absorb 10 amino acids maybe it's nine it depends on who you read and of those amino acids <clears throat> three of them are called branch chain and those branch chain amino acids are so important for connective tissue which are the bones the tendons the lig ligaments and the muscles remember tendons attach muscle to bones ligaments attach bones to bones and I don't know about you but where I hang out there's a lot of horses that get lame and everyone's blaming it on an intense show schedule but they're all breaking down with uh, tendon injuries or ligament strains um, suspensories etc and we're just talking about navicular disease which is all about the soft tissue inside the hoof they're talking about the navicular bursa and a bursa is like a water-filled balloon stuck between your hands and you can roll your hands back and forth on this water-filled balloon that's what a bursa is it goes between the bone the navicular bone and the deep digital flexor to provide um, lubrication and uh, decrease friction there but a lot of times that becomes inflamed so does the tendon itself so do the bones so do the ligaments and so do um, the other soft tissues in that area and where you have inflammation you have breakdown now those breakdown products have to be taken away but they also have to be repaired and if your horse isn't getting enough protein in the form of essential amino acids it cannot maintain or even repair some of these uh, connected tissue things and the number one source of protein for a horse is hay um, and grass I should say grass first and then hay and you have to have good quality grass now a lot of you don't have good quality grass because it's winter or you lived out here in the subtropics and it's just not that good and then we have hay and what everybody does is they supplement with grain and grain has literally no protein uh, the corn wheat and oats that you give the horse is very low in protein now you can add a protein supplement such as soybean meal uh, or whey protein and you can actually increase the protein values now here's the one key thing I want you to know about essential amino acids there are 10 of them all of them have a minimum amount that you need to maintain uh, the effectiveness but if one of them just one of them is not at a hundred percent of what its minimum is let's say you're only giving 80 percent of that then 80 percent of all the other essential amino acids will be absorbed and 20 percent won't it doesn't matter how much of those that you're giving it goes in lockstep so if you only have 20 80 percent of lysine you're only going to have 80 percent of methionine arginine all these other tyrosine all these other ones and your horse is not getting enough protein so I would if you have a horse with some sort of navicular disease or any lameness I would increase the protein of these horses and make sure they have the building blocks they need to to build these things and by the way whenever you give your horse a joint supplement it's basically broken down into the essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids those are absorbed and they're reassembled on the other side as proteins that then end up becoming senility fluid so I suggest that you start looking for a better quality um, uh, protein source uh, neutrino mix uh, pro add which is uh, whey protein and of course the uh, tried and true calf mana uh, the only problem with these protein supplements is they have sugar in them and if you're trying to go on a sugar-free diet they will have sugar in it okay so my horse has deformed hooves but it's not showing pain well you're lucky now get to work and correct 
uh, the trimming or shoeing to get things back to normal. And this may be easier said than done. And maybe a set of x-rays might help so you can actually see the coffin bone and the navicular bones and see if they're all balanced left to right um, and make sure that uh, everything's good. But I suggest that you find a nice level stretch. And I don't mean your dirt road driveway that has a groove down you know, where the tire tracks go. Uh, and be careful of taking the horse out on asphalt, a crowned road, because if you jog a horse on a road, if you're not jogging down the center, then you're on an angled surface. So that can be tough. So take your horse someplace, um, a parking lot where everything's flat and level. Just get him out there and jog him and see what happens. The toe and the heel should be landing at the same time, and the left side and right side should be hand landing at the same time. But if it's not, and the horse is def decidedly landing on the toe, and you've got underslung heels, you've got a broken hoof patch and axis, then you know you've got some problems. It's, it's big yellow flags, if not almost red flags, waving at you, and you need to uh, readjust how you trim the horse. And getting back to the question the person asked, how do you do this? Well, you do it carefully with a good eye that's trained in physics, and you, and you get that toe moved back, and you keep the toe short, and you try and get that toe not to jam because that's what's causing the tubules to come underneath and crush the heel. And slowly you'll start to get that heel to come backwards. It's a long, long discussion between uh, professionals that's been going on for decades. And I don't know if anybody has the right answer for your horse. That's why you need to talk with them and discuss it and try things. And it's going to take a year. It's not like done overnight. This takes a long time to res reshape the, the, the hoof. But try to avoid uneven terrain. If your horse is definitely um, uh, deformed, he's not showing pain, just be aware of that. And maybe avoid uh, uneven terrain for the next two, three, four, five, six months as you reshape the foot and try and get back where it's going. And remember, LSD. I love LSD in horses. I call it long, slow distance. You may call it a hallucinogenic drug, but I'm talking about the long, slow distance to strengthen your connective tissues of your horse. There's nothing better than taking a horse on long, slow distances to improve the um, strength and tensile um, uh, strength of the connected tissues down there. So I think my horse is painful. Now, this is a really tough one because sometimes they look good and sometimes they don't look good. These horses usually do better if they're turned out running around. But if you bring them in the stall for two or three days because you have an ice storm, a snowstorm, it's a rain, something, something's happening, the horse is brought inside, and the horse becomes lame, that's usually caudal heel pain. It's like arthritis. If you don't use it, it gets stiff on you, and that's what's happening with these horses. The best thing to do is if your horse is lame, after he's kept in for a while, keep your horse in for a day, and then have your vet come and block the heels just to make sure that that's what's going on. He or she might want to block one heel and see if the horse goes better and then block the other heel. And if the horse gets 90% sound or better, then you know you have caudal heel pain, and you know where you can uh, start focusing on it. You can also use uh, phenylbutazone or bute, which is a drug which is anti-inflammatory, for diagnostics. If your horse is a little lame, you give them a, a low dose of bute. Be sure to talk to your veterinarian to see what the appropriate dose will be. And if the horse moves out sound after about an hour after bute, then you know it's pain. And then you can say, okay, it's, it's a pain-related thing. It's not like a hitch in the get-along that the horse is going to have or the lameness, lameness is caused by EPM. It's a neurological deficit or something like that. At least you know it's pain in the, in the caudal heel or pain somewhere. And then if you do the block, then you know it's in the foot. Uh, some people like to use hoof testers. I think um, if you don't do it a lot, it's very hard to read. Um, and the other thing is a lot of people like x-rays. Veterinarians especially like x-rays because they look in and they can see these changes. But I've seen horrific changes on x-rays, and the horse is virtually sound. And I've seen horses where you can barely see any problems, and the horse is head-bobbing lame. So I don't see a correlation between the two. I think it depends on the threshold of pain, the internal fortitude of your horse, and just literally how painful this thing is. If it's a fractured navicular bone, uh, there's not much trimming that you're going to do to help that. That's a long-standing case. Uh, your horse may have had a developmental joint disease as a youngster by being overfed grain. that has something called osteochondrosis desiccans that affect it and has a big cyst in the navicular bone. There's nothing you can do about that. There's no surgery. So a set of x-rays can rule some of those things out. And again, get your vet in there to help you through this thing. But it's really up to you to look at that foot and try and get it back to where it needs to be. All right. Um, 
and remember, sometimes a hoof shows pain only one until you block that hoof, and then the other one suddenly becomes painful. So this is usually bilateral disease. Uh, sometimes when you lunge a horse, he's laying in one direction, not in the other. I don't find that too often with navicular. I think it's more common with uh, collateral ligament strains, uh, but it can be uh, if it's just located on one side of one navicular bone. It can be that way, so that can be a little confusing. Now, let's say your horse is painful. Get together with your vet and farrier and develop a plan. Uh, try to find the position that the hoof is most comfortable in. This may be wedging just one side of the hoof. Sometimes wedging the heels help these horses, and on occasion, wedging the toe helps these horses. It is so crazy, but you have to think in three dimensions. This whole discussion was in two dimensions, but you have to think in three dimensions, and you have to have somebody who has a lot of experience. But you, as the owner, have to be diligent and observe everything. There's no one recipe to fix this, but the, if you want one recipe, it's to use your head and really look, use your eyes and power observation, and take a look at that foot and try and get it back to a more normal, vector-pleasing approach. Okay? You can add butte. It says add butt, but it should be add butte. Oh, I can change that right now. This is cool. Don't do that. Butte. Uh, add butte is necessary to keep them comfortable. Um, I've had horses on one gram of butte uh, a day for years and had no problems, but I know I've also had a horse with one gram of butte a day made them uh, uneasy and uncomfortable. Um, I would probably make sure that your horse is off all sugar if you're going to be adding butte because both of them can cause colonic ulcers as well as cecal ulcers. So just be aware of that. Take them off grain. Use nothing but gra uh, hay and grass if you're going to keep butte on uh, for long term. Uh, neurectomy is the last resort. That's where you actually go in and cut the nerves that innervate the back of the heels, and it takes the pain away. It numbs the foot. It can also go wrong, especially if you continue to work the horse. They can actually, if it's not done right, they can actually lose the whole foot. Uh, I don't want to go into it because it's kind of disgusting, but um, if you know a skilled person knows how to cut those nerves, a surgeon, um, a veterinarian, um, they can last for several years, sometimes three years, but the nerves regenerate and some of the feeling does come back, and doing a second neurectomy usually isn't that successful. Uh, and finally, re euthanasia is a real possibility. Um, many horses have been uh, euthanized because they've lost all function and they're so painful, it's the only uh, a civil thing to do with these guys. So it's much better to work on prevention. So here's some take-home points. Here's a severe um, long heel contracted heels caused by a horse that's been leaning on its toe for a long time. Um, and, uh, and you can also see sheared heels. The thumb is on the higher heel. Um, on the left side, as you look at it, the right heel is lower. Uh, this horse is just not put well together, and, and, and this has just been a chronic case. Um, and hopefully your horse doesn't look like this because that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of skill to get it back where you need to go. The take-home points, long toe, low heel equals collar heel pain. Now, does the collar heel pain cause it, or does that cause collar heel pain? I think if you talk to enough old-timers, which I'm unfortunately are part of, I feel like if we could get rid of long toe, low heel, we'd see a lot less caudal heel pain. And so, yes, I think it does point to human error and human cause behind this. Um, I don't want to point fingers at any um, group of people because there's a lot of good fairs out there who know what they're doing. But it's up to you as the owner, as a horse's advocate, to know what's going on with your horse and to look at the horse's, uh, the shape of the foot yourself. And now you know. Prevention is always better. It's all about the forces applied to the hoof. It's the forces that change the hoof. And if you see that the hooves are looking different and not normal, it's because abnormal forces are being applied, and you need to go in and find out why. And be sure to provide the proteins needed to repair the damage and relieve the pain as necessary. Okay, I'm going to open up the floor to some more questions, but right now it's a shameless plug for the horse's advocate. Just go to the equinepractice.com. And right there, you just click on Advocate, and you can join us. And once you join, the only reason you have to join is because I have to make sure that you understand that I'm not your veterinarian. So that's all you're going to do. You're going to agree to that statement, and that this is for general educational purposes. And then you have access to all the articles, newsletters, um, what do you call it, uh, videos, whiteboard presentations. And I'm going to be moving into this. I've got probably two dozen videos I haven't even put on there yet. Uh, and probably a thousand more photographs that are just sitting on my hard drive that I'm going to be putting on the next 
three or four months. So it's just going to keep expanding. And I've got a Facebook user group we can all get together and talk on. Uh, but help join uh, the horses and help the horse thrive in the human world. And don't forget, if you live in the United States and you want your horse's teeth done the old-fashioned way using horsemanship skills, we are the, um, the horsemanship dentistry experience. Um, we are dentistry, and you should give us a call. Uh, this is Melissa, the gal with the clown shoes and the high heels, uh, floating a horse with her hand being used as a speculum on an unsedated horse. And this is the normal. This is what we get in about 90% of the horses that we work on. So um, another thing I'd like you to ask you to do is subscribe to our YouTube page. You can uh, look us up on YouTube uh, at The Equine Practice. Uh, we should be there. We should pop up. We'd love to see you uh, come visit us there. I've also written three books. You can find them also on the equine practice. Uh, this book is The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. It, it shows you how we can connect um, in 30 seconds, not 30 days, not 30 minutes. It's what we do every day, day in and day out, to about oh, 4,000 horses, anywhere from here to Seattle to Vermont, Louisiana, Tennessee. We go all over the place. I'm licensed in 10 states, so give us a call. Um, I can work in any state as long as your vet is there, um, um, if I'm not licensed in that state. As long as they're there and uh, they're inviting me in to work on the horse, uh, then I'm legal. Um, and we like to stay legal as best we can. All right, two incredible stories of a horse vet, just some really nice stories that is it just from my experience as being horse vet. And, of course, since the days of the Romans, which is my autobiography, if you've ever had a reading disability or some disability that stopped you from doing something, uh, it kept me out of vet school for five years. Uh, but there's a best time in my life because then I ended up working as the thoroughbred breeding training farm, uh, became their assistant farm manager, and learned everything I know about horses there. And then went back to Cornell um, and went on from Cornell undergraduate school to Cornell vet school. So um, that's me. That's my truck. Uh, on a lonely country road, uh, pull off to the side where I'm going to park for a second and listen to you guys and for all your questions. Uh, that's the chicken, the egg thing. Um, thrush is really interesting. Thrush is an opportunistic organism that gets into the um, uh, skin, uh, and the skin in this case is hoof. Because uh, even though it's dead keratin that you see that the farrier carves away, it's still a living entity. And it's an opportunistic that gets in there and starts to grow. Um, the caudal heel pain can cause the heels to contract, uh, just like it does in this picture. And all the manure can get up in there and cause uh, thrush. And I'll tell you, there, there's two steps to doing, uh, taking care of thrush as far as I'm concerned. One is to open up the, the traps that hold the manure in there. Uh, by a good uh, sharp knife and a good farrier who can get in there and clean all this up, all the, these spaces, open up the heels so the manure can fall out. And second, once you've cleaned it out, cleaned it out well, take a pinch of cotton and shove it in there. And the, what the cotton does is it helps open it up and allows air in because the bacteria that causes thrush is an anaerobe. And if you give it air, it'll actually die. Um, then, on top of that cotton, squirt some penicillin, just procaine penicillin G that's out of a bottle. It doesn't even have to be uh, in date. It could be some of your out-of-date penicillin. It still works. And you put it in there, and that will shrink up the cotton, and then jam the cotton deeper into the crevice. Add some more cotton, add some more penicillin, and keep doing that until you can't jab, jab any more in there. And walk away. And in about two or three days, well, let's just say the next day, pull it out and do it again. In about three or four or five days, uh, most of your thrush will be gone because you've killed it. Oh, my wife is yelling at me, use copper tox. It's so funny because I was supposed to copper tox. I didn't think it worked. But down here in Florida where it's just nothing but moisture, it actually does a really good dry, dry, job of drying up. But if you have an active case of thrush, get your cotton and penicillin in there and take care of that and then go ahead and use the, the copper tox because it's the copper in there that will drive the moisture out and makes it an inhospitable environment for uh, bacteria to get in there. So I think that's a really good way of taking care of thrush. Any other questions? Well, thank you for all who are thanking me. I thank you for joining us. I thank you for staying to the very end because uh, oftentimes um, most people, you know, at webinars just bug out, but hopefully I've caught 
all your attention. Anyway, that's me. That's an old picture of me, but I still look something like that, especially when I wear my hat. I want to thank you for your time and becoming your horse's advocate. This is Doc T. If there aren't any other questions, um, I'm going to sign off. All right, thank you all. Um, and remember, this broadcast is going to be edited and put on my website, and it's going to be on YouTube. Go to YouTube, the equine practice, uh, or you can also look at me as horse vet. It's getting all choppy. Okay, gotta go. <laughs> it's, it's choppy because. Oh, because I'm moving. Uh, YouTube also is under horse vet, H O R Z V E T, H O R Z V E T. Same as my phone number, triple eight horse vet, H O R Z V E T, eight eight eight. Horse vet, if you need me to come out and take care of your horse's teeth from Melissa, uh, she works in South Carolina and all over Florida, um, and I work in most of the other states. All right, so give me a shout-out if you need me, and thanks very much.